Good evening. Welcome all. Welcome here to Seattle Opera at the Center and to a bird's eye view telling the story of Charlie Parker through opera. We're gathered here at Seattle Opera at the Center in the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people. That reminder, is, that acknowledgement is a reminder that we strive to build respectful relationships with all people as we work together for reconciliation and healing. And it is a great pleasure for me to greet you all and welcome you to this very, very special evening. I'm Jonathan Dean. I'm the Seattle Opera dramaturg and co-moderator of our little discussion this evening in our Tuesday night opera talk series. And the first person I need to introduce is my uh, co-moderator, Abe Beeson, who is KNKX Radio. Your jazz voice here in Seattle. And Abe is also uh, the, um, the new cool. Uh, host. Um, and uh, he's here as a jazz fan, I'm here as an opera fan, and we're teaming up tonight to interrogate our composer and our librettist for Charlie Parker's Yardbird. It's a really, really, really neat pleasure to have Daniel Schneider and Bridget Wimberly with us here in Seattle. Thank you. Before we dive in, I do have a little bit of housekeeping that I need to uh, point out before we start grilling the two of them. Um, this uh, next up in our Tuesday night Opera Talk series in March, on March 24th, we have an event called the uh, Going on Record, the How, Why, and Huh of Opera Recordings. It'll be a panel discussion about uh, how opera recording works, how we use opera recordings with our brand new neighbors, King FM, who are going to move into the space right through, you can see through that window, in about two weeks. So we're excited to welcome them to the building and to sort of talk about what opera recordings are all for. Um, this is actually quite a night for us here in Seattle Opera at the Center, and there's another event with another local station. We've got well-represented local media. KCTS in the room on the corner, uh, Tagney Jones there this evening. And uh, just uh, uh, mention to you, if you are uh, exiting um, either by the elevator or our staff will direct you to the staircase to use, um, there is spillover from that KCTS event happening in the outer lobby. So as you go through and you see a bunch of people looking at a screen or listening, um, if you could be respectful of that, that will, that will help us all make the most use of this facility. Uh, but let's go ahead now and find out a little bit about the uh, opera that's now having its West Coast and Seattle premiere, Charlie Parker's Yardbird, which premiered in 2015 at Opera Philadelphia. And uh, our creative team here, Bridget Wimberly, is a poet. She describes herself as a closet poet uh, originally, who then has become a published poet and a playwright and an opera librettist. And Daniel Schneider, a musician trained both classically and in jazz, first uh, performing as a cellist, but uh, nowadays we can see you performing as a flute player and a saxophone player and composing with both jazz and, and classical, both for Abe's people and for my people. Um, I would actually for all love the people. to, my, my first question I guess is the, the contact point. I just found this out this morning, so I wanted to find out more about how the two of you, it was, there is connection with Charlie Parker on both sides. It started with your brother, it sounds like, played a role. And, and, and actually, Bridget, we'll, we'll talk more about your family because your uncle has a, a part to play in this as well. But could you tell us, how, each of you, how you got connected to this opera in the first place? And maybe we'll start with you. I found out about it from my brother, who is a colleague of Daniel's, and he just mentioned that um, he was looking for a librettist to write an opera about Charlie Parker. And because I've been hearing about Charlie Parker all my life, I said, oh, and, and then um, contacted him. And Daniel, will you tell us how, how you got started on the, the whole journey? Um, yes, I was supposed to write an opera for Larry. Lawrence Brownlee, and... Um, Opera lovers of Seattle know Lawrence Brownlee pretty well. Uh, Raise your hand, you've been to uh, five Lawrence Brownlee performances. <laughs> Ten. Okay. Uh, has anybody um, been to all of them? I don't know, lost count, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, he, he's he's so, well loved here. What happened is um, that I played a concert in Lausanne. I'm originally from uh, Zurich, Switzerland, and I was composer in residence in Lausanne, and I played a concert there, and... Um, uh, Corrado Rovaris, the, the general music director in Philadelphia, was conducting the opera there in Lausanne, and he came to the concert. It was a Sunday morning, and then he was totally fascinated by my playing, I guess, and came, came after the concert, he came up to me and said, you have to write an opera for us. 
And I said, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> For Philadelphia, and it was not Seattle, actually. But um, You like hearing that kind of thing from feedback. After, you never know what people are going to say after a yeah, performance. Yeah, I, I thought that he was probably going to say, I liked the concert. Or it was, <laughs> I mean, that was impressive or something like that. But you have to write an opera for us. I've never heard that before. But um, yes, and then it, 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 we actually had to find a libretto, something that, that works for Lawrence Brown Lee, because that was the precondition that the opera works for him as a lead. And uh, then some Brazilian librettist wrote something, but I was not really happy with it. It didn't really fly. It didn't really, you know, you have to, it, this is the thing as a composer, you always have to find something that, um, it, yeah, that, that, that fascinates you that, you, that that you can actually write the music. Otherwise, the music goes nowhere. That's since, since ever that was a problem. There was a problem also for Mozart, you know. I, I, ich brauche ein Büchlein. I, say, I, I need a little booklet in order to activate my creative... Um, How do you get the musical juice flowing? Yes. There has to be an inspiration yes, out there. Yes, um, there needs to be an inspiration. And then uh, I saw a performance by Lawrence Brown Lee, by Larry, in, in New York, and then I knew that I wanted to write an opera about Charlie Parker, because he looks a little bit like Charlie Parker, and his voice is very flexible and, and very fast. Uh, and so I thought, okay, that's the, perfect, uh, that's the perfect topic. And then, after that, we met through Michael. She already told that story. And, and, and he's, a, he's a, another jazz performer? Uh, Michael, Michael, is, Michael yeah. is a drummer, yes, a yes. Drummer. We, we, we did actually a couple of projects together with um, African musicians from Mali in, in Berlin, in the Philharmonic in Berlin. Uh, we did a whole, um, you can look it up on, on, on YouTube, a part of it is on YouTube, it's called Sundia Daketa, it's an epos, uh, uh, you know, in Mali about the king in the 14th, 15th century in Mali. A big thing with a lot of secret music from Africa, but that's a whole other topic. I don't know that. <laughs> and, that's your next opera. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I already wrote that. I transcribed that whole music, which is kind of sacred, secret music from Africa, and put it into large orchestra and chorus. And uh, we did that in in Berlin, and that was. Uh, yeah, that was a great thing, and he helped a lot um, finding the African musicians, the griots that knew that music, and also uh, he played the drums. Mm. Yeah, so that's how I connected to her brother, and then we connected through the, later on. For and the so Charlie this Park idea role. of doing an opera about one of the greatest jazz musicians of all time, this is where we get this bridge going between two worlds of music that sometimes you know are, are there's a there's a gap there and maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, how that works i mean you you've gone back and forth between jazz and classical yeah you wrote this opera it was going to be was it going to be one or the other it was going to be somehow a mix yeah definitely it has to reflect uh, charlie parker's music but uh, also the idea of um, what he wanted to do at the time i, I also uh, spoke to gunter schuler and he told me too that he met charlie parker and he always was talking about writing some symphonic piece symphonic music and that's kind of the hook of the whole opera that uh, charlie parker wanted to write some music but they finally never 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 did it and um Yes, uh, and this is the, the bridge, you know, between the, the, the two things. Charlie Parker was an improviser. The improvisation is not written music, and he wrote a couple of tunes, but the tunes were, you know, were like 32 bars, and uh, the opera, I don't know how many bars, uh, <laughs> but, but a lot of bars, probably. Many thousands, yeah. 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 Uh, probably a million notes <laughs> written on, on, on paper, and that's a huge effort. And sometimes, even if you have a very creative, great musician, this is, there's some resistance there, you know, to actually abstract all that music that's in your head onto a piece of paper. And that's one of the topics of, of, of the opera. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Daniel, you're a musician, obviously, found some inspiration from Charlie Parker. Bridget, on the other hand, Charlie Parker was kind of a persona non grata in your home. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about um, that history and then how you decided uh, to start um, learning more about this guy. 
Well, every, as far back as I can remember, um, my grandmother and my mother um, talked about Charlie Parker was the devil incarnate, uh, really. Um, because um, my grandmother said he came to Cleveland. My uncle, who was my mother's twin brother, and they were born on the, uh, August 29th, which is also Charlie Parker's birthday. But um, my uncle was obsessed with him, so he was, maybe Charlie was somewhere in his 20s, and, and, and he was just a teenager. And he got hooked on heroin, trying to th maybe thinking that he could play like Charlie Parker. But my grandmother blamed Charlie Parker for that. So since I was a little, little girl, I heard Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker, that dog, that is, that, <laughs> over and over and over again. He's the, and then my uncle died um, uh, at, th at 35. Charlie Parker died at 34. Um, and, and in between their birthdays being on the same day, they, except for the fact that Charlie became famous, my uncle didn't. Um, and that just ate my grandmother up. So, so hearing that over and over and over and over again, when, um, when my brother mentioned Daniel and Charlie Parker, I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard that name before. <laughs> and I was, um, and I'm a playwright, so I just written some plays. I was lucky enough to do a play with Ruby D did my first play. But um, I wanted to do something different. So I thought, well, let me just, it would be interesting to investigate the story I've been hearing forever. And, um, and so I wanted to do it. So I told my brother, I, I want to meet Daniel. And so I called him up, and, you know, we, we talked, and the next thing I knew, I was doing it. <laughs> and, um, and in doing it, I found out that Charlie wasn't the, you know, the, the, the man my, um, my grandmother thought he was. I mean, he didn't put the needle in his arm, but a lot of um, musicians thought that that was the road to greatness, you know, you was heroin, you could hear better, you could play better, you could, I don't even know. But it was, um, it was very satisfying for me that I could put to rest the idea that somebody, some famous man that people idolize, actually was the cause of my uncle, my mother's twin brother's demise. Mm -hmm. So in reading about him and the struggle that he had, it was mother had, you know, just the times, just being black in America, I understood that what he did with his own life, tragic as it was, being, you know, uh, also using heroin and just trying to make it as a musician in the United States, that I, 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 felt, like I fell in love with him, really, as, as, a, as a soul. So it was, time to try to figure out what about his real life was, you know, you could form a story. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started to begin. You start with, from the place of, oh, he's the devil, and there's more to it than that. He's not necessarily an angel, but this very, very, very complicated, complicated figure. We were talking earlier about, yeah, only 34 years old, but a very busy life. And I understand that the first draft of the libretto had a lot of the biographical information, which is, is complicated. There's four wives, there's uh, all these different trips back and forth. How, what was the process like of, of boiling it down, of, of finding a way to hone it into the opera that we have, which is about 90 minutes long, it's a one-act opera, it's very intense. You'll, you'll go in, you'll, you'll sit down, it'll zap you, and then at the end, I mean, I, I haven't been to a performance, but I'm guessing at the end everyone's sort of, wow, uh, is probably the experience. How, how, do you, how, how did you shape that? Well, okay, uh, that one thing is <laughs> you have to watch out that you don't have one aria after the other. You know, somebody's singing, okay, I, I feel very unhappy today, and then the next one is saying, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, feel, I'm feeling unhappy too. And so that, that, then it, gets, it gets really boring after a while. So you have to see where can they sing together, where they, you have scenes where three of them can sing together, and where can I actually... Um, 
speed up the opera by by just using a, a you know a, a faster pulse in the music, but also by by adding some drama, some conflicts. Where are the conflicts? Because if everybody agrees, you know, then you will probably end up with some nice music, but uh, slightly boring. You know, you, you you lose the drama. So this is the thing which is also completely uh, different from a play because you don't have that many plays where more than one one guy or is, is talking at the same time. You know, if you have more people do, uh, talking at the same time in a play, it, you can't really understand what's going on. But in opera, that's, uh, that's, that's very normal. We love normal. that in opera, yeah. yeah. Uh, we don't have a chorus in that opera, but that, that would actually add another dimension, you know, that you have a, a lot of people singing something than other people singing on top, but we have also scenes toward the end where everybody is singing, and it's very similar to a, a chorus situation. And for me, I tried, I understood the women that, that was in his life. His mother, number one, he had four wives, but one of them, um, she had very little time with him. She said the only thing Charlie Parker gave her was his heroin addict, his heroin addiction. And then there was Rebecca, his first wife. There was Doris, the, the um, actually Doris and Chan. Um, uh, they, were, they knew each other. Uh, Chan was dating Charlie, then Doris kind of stole him, and then Chan got mad. And anyway, Chan went, uh, um, so when he got, when he got, um, in Cal arrested and sent to Cal Cal Camarillo. Camarillo. Yeah. Um, Doris came to his rescue and got him out of there. So these ladies wanted the same thing. They, you know, he was a fascinating man. Um, but um, so I wanted to, to make sure that we understood each of the women. They had different journeys with him, and then the same journey. They they loved him. But, um, but the conflict was what happens to yourself when you devote yourself to somebody else whose devotion is all to music. So that's what I found interesting. And as a playwright, you just gotta put it all down there and then you have to try to strip it away, you know, or else it'll, it'll take 30 years. <laughs> to finish. It's interesting that you, you point on the three female characters, and those three uh, ladies, the three wives, are major characters in our opera, Rebecca and Doris and Chan. Although, as, as you point out, there's also this other character, the saxophone. And Charlie's big love song, his big aria, is really to the saxophone and not to any of the, the women who loved him. They sing love songs yeah. to him. I mean, there's also Eddie, obviously, which, the mother, which was very important in Jolly Parker's life. And that's a, a completely different relationship. I mean, he, he was very attached to his mother. And um, she was very attached to him. And that's another relationship that, that uh, Bridget explored. And then the third is um, uh, the relationship to Nika, the, the, the Baroness, which is uh, sort of a, a jazz um, lover and the uh, arts um, lover. And, and these this, this, uh, different relationships are explored in, in different parts of the opera. I think one of my favorite things about jazz is uh, the musicians um, ultimate goal is to share who they are as a person through their music, through whether that's singing or just through their, what they're playing with their horns, uh, which makes Charlie Parker's story a little bit difficult to get to sometimes. He didn't write an autobiography. He would probably tell you that to learn about me, listen to my records. Uh, but I wonder how you two went about um, communicating who he was as a person, his personality, um, from the perspective of uh, the people who loved him and uh, from the perspective of his music. Well, okay, for, for me, it, it was um, more like the, the music, which was a, a very interesting part, because the music has a very high degree of perfection. He was a perfectionist, and his style was very defined. It's, it's, it's a little bit like Mozart, you know, if, um, you know that the, the, the music that he played has a, a degree of perfection that you actually cannot, usually you cannot, get to that point easily. 
And he, he, was, he was able to get to that point even when he was drunk or when, when he was on drugs. And that's probably also what uh, your uncle was fascinated with, you know, that, that, that somebody that uh, has a difficult time to be sober and a difficult time to, to, to stay away from drugs is able to achieve that kind of, of, of result. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in many ways, that, that relates to, to um, Mozart, in my opinion. And I was fascinated with that because uh, that's not that many people have that kind of easiness. But it also, in, in my life, in people that I uh, confront that, uh, or I met and I've worked with that had that kind of easy access to music usually have some other problems to deal with. You know? <laughs> and in the case of Charlie Parker, this was very obvious, yes. Mm -hmm. And Bridget, how did you uh, uh, learn, uh, what did you learn about his personality from those people that loved him? I think that Charlie Parker loved his music more than anything. Um, and I think Doris says that in an interview um, about Charlie. She's, you know, she said, you could love him to death, but really his whole drive was just creating music. Maybe Chan may have been, turned out to be the love of his life, um, but, um, but music was always it. He was the music himself. So high, sleepy, you know, whatever. He had to play. And once I realized that, as a woman, understanding some men you date, you wonder, <laughs> um, I understood that was his drive for whatever reason if it was perfection or, or whatever was driving him the women in his life, life and I don't think he could really function without them uh, Doris did a lot of things to hold his life together that was her importance his mother since he was this high praised him to death, get him everything he needed. Oh, look at horn, here's a horn. You want this, do that. Um, she thought he was, like she said, he was the most beautiful baby she had ever seen in her life. And, um, and she was always giving him praises. And she was always terrified that something was going to happen to him. Um, so, and Chan just loved him. She, he seemed to love her, um, maybe, maybe because she was uh, also a dancer, and, uh, you know and attractive, and, um, and probably other women that, you know, just never made it to the history books. But, um, but his one love was his horn. And that was consistent. Even though he sold his horn, he did all kind of things with his horn. But the horn really was him, because it was his, no, his breath, his ideas, his whatever that, that made the music exist. So it was first I had to understand that. And then I had to think about my own grandmother again and her son who was, wanted to be a, you know, a jazz star and um, a saxophonist as well. And how she always propped him up and held him up and the same thing. So there were similarities, similarities between Addie and, um, and, um, and my grandmother. And the, you know, the hard work and just the struggle of just you know, surviving but idolizing your only son, which was my grandmother. She had four girls. She said, every time I had a baby, I had a, um, a girl. And so, of course, my mother was the girl she had when she had uh, my uncle. So he was like king to her, in a sense. And then to see him, you know, die was um, tragic. And Addie, the same thing, you know, don't, nothing, she, that was her only child. But, um, she would have done anything for him. And when he was really getting into a lot of trouble, she um, told him, you know, go. Just get out of Kansas City, because she thought he was, someone's gonna lynch him or something was gonna happen to him. Um, so it was really, just as a female, just looking at what a mother wouldn't do for, you know, her most precious thing in the world. And, uh, and then her death when, you know, Doris calls her and asks her, are you sitting down? She knew. Operatic journey, certainly for all of these women. And, and 
how fantastic to have them as characters in the show. Daniel, I think I was reading an interview with you where you said, oh, if I was going to do an opera about jazz in this period, I wouldn't want to have an opera about the musicians because they were all male. And how boring would that be if there was no ladies' voices in the opera? We have in the opera, we've got uh, Charlie, who's played by the tenor, and the baritone, who plays Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, which is odd, of course, because when you listen to the two of them, the real life's characters jamming, usually the trumpet, Dizzy, is higher than the, the alto sax. But uh, how, tell us a little bit about the role Dizzy plays and, and musically, how, that, how you take these two guys whose, whose musical voices, whose musical identities, the creators of bebop, are pretty well known. How do you inflect that into your own music? Well, okay, there are little quotes, little hidden, hidden things in the whole opera that re refer to um, uh, music that Charlie Parker played or Dizzy Gillespie plays, and they were also fighting over it, you know, like I invented bebop, and then, the, uh, and then Charlie Parker says, no, no, I invented that, and, and excuse me, that was my tune. So there's, there's a, actually, uh, they're very good friends, but on the other hand, also, they, they claim the same thing, you know, that I invented it, no, I invented this new music. So, um, yes, uh, if you actually listen to the opera and you know about jazz music, but you or know about opera too, I mean, it has, a, or classical music, there are all kinds of little things hidden inside the texture that uh, refer to certain things that, um, certain songs of Charlie Parker, certain songs of Dizzy Gillespie, but also the great American songbook, but also, for instance, Beethoven, big symphony in E flat. The Eroica, we hear the Eroica, you hear that. something in the French horn. If you really, you can listen to that, that like a couple of times. These are then, Easter eggs that are sort of hidden, yeah, hidden Easter treasures. Yeah, Easter eggs, yes, exactly. If you were, uh, well, I was noticing we were doing this rehearsal just here earlier today, and there's a, you have Charlie quoting Shakespeare at one point in the libretto. He says, um, uh, it's just a walking shadow. Uh, yeah, but is, uh, it, yeah. is it that kind of thing where you just you, you grab a little yeah. bit that's out there, that's sort of in the... Well, yeah, that's uh, the, the Prospero thing also. It, it all dissolves into nothingness, yes, yeah, yes, into yes, airing, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, there's so those, the, stuff in the, the, in the libretto. Uh, because uh, that's something that Charlie Parker uh, did himself a lot. You know, he was quoting other composers. Uh, during his solos, he was able to do that, which is a very difficult thing because there's a song going on, and then you have to superimpose another song on top of that. So you without uh, changing key, without changing key. Yes, he was able. That's also in the opera. He was able to play every song in every key. So he's he's actually working on that during the opera. He's practicing. We just went through the practicing wrong. Uh, of that, uh, he's playing Cherokee in, in all different keys. But he was able to play all all the songs in all different keys, at all different speeds. <laughs> so, um, and that's also reflected in, in in the opera. You know, this kind of flexibility to. Um, being able to quote from the whole repertoire, not just the jazz repertoire, he was also able to quote Stravinsky, Bartok, he was a big fan of Bartok's music, and uh, whatever else. So the opera plays with that ability too. I also thought it was interesting, kind of uh, similar lines about uh, the idea of uh, a composer of a song, as Dizzy says, oh, this is my song, and yeah. oh, it's my song. Uh, but for a lot of jazz folks, you would say, the song is never the same twice. And it's kind of a commentary on the idea of improvisation versus uh, composition, and uh, the idea that a song is only in the moment, and then it's gone forever. Yes, and, and also a lot of songs, because they actually created in the same moment of history, it's, it's the same thing with Mozart too, that a lot of compositions are a little bit similar. So, you know, one guy said, no, 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 I, I, that, that's my invention. No, that's my invention. Um, and then in, in the case of the opera, it was, uh, I think, Manteca. So it was really uh, the Dizzy Gillespie, mm -hmm. Dizzy Gillespie's composition, not Charlie With Parker's. John Pozo, probably, a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, it, uh, there's a lot of stuff to be explored in the, in the score. And... Um, 
Yes. We, need to, we need to the annotated edition or the, the director's commentary thing where you go through and identify all of those little moments uh, yeah, for us at some point. But I suppose some I of mean, it is hidden if you get it, if you don't. It's not, not obvious, you know, it's not a whole part and you cannot really detect it without knowing. We, I mean, is it important? Do we have to like collect all of no. those or you can no. just, no, they, no. Can, they can go by? No, it's like you're looking at the carpet, you don't have to actually know exactly how the carpet's <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back to this question about improvisation versus something that's fixed. I mean, what is ultimately the difference between jazz and classical? I mean, I, I hate the word classical, and referring to music. Classical music is really Vienna 1750 to about 1810 or 1805, something. Uh, but of course, classical music is just you know the whole system of training of these instruments. I mean, from your point, you you go back and forth in both, and you yeah. you're familiar with Günther Schuller, who was the 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 other this third stream idea in American music. Mm -hmm. That why do we have to have the two sides of the river? Mm -hmm. um, for, to, what's, to your perspective. How, What's the difference? Well, well, we refer to classical music as music that's written down. You know, you have a score and, and all the music is, is, is more or less uh, defined and on a piece of paper. And that's actually also reflected in the, in the opera. And Charlie Parker tries to do that, you know, put, but to put his music down on paper. And um, that's sort of his last wish before he has to definitely uh, go. And um, this is what we refer to as classical music is, is something that's, uh, that's, that's um, written down by a composer and then the musicians have to actually inter, you know, come up with an interpretation of what's on the paper. And in, in the jazz world, uh, the most important thing is the improvisation that actually you have a, a song which is important or not so important <laughs> and the important thing is what you actually do with the song, how you improvise on the changes, how you actually develop the song. And um, I would say like in the classical time or before in the Baroque time, Bach and Beethoven were great improvisers too. They knew exactly how to do that. But since there was no recording industry at the time, they said, okay, I cannot, I cannot record that, what I'm playing here. I have to write it down on a piece of paper. And then it, it became an, a document that we can reproduce. And with Charlie Parker, uh, we have a document on a, on, on a recording, and we can actually you know, transcribe that and reproduce it too. But it's a slightly different thing. I think today, um, we would not really play Mozart that much if we would have a recording of, of himself playing it. <laughs> uh, because they would say, okay, man, this is so great, I don't know whether I have to do it again. It's like a John Coltrane. Do I have to play that solo again? <laughs> Giant steps? I don't know. I mean, maybe it's so good, I, I, I can't do it any, any better. You know, but uh, with classical music, it's different because it's an abstraction, and you can do all, all kinds of different interpretations from that abstraction. Mm -hmm. And there, that, I think that's today that's the main the main difference. When Bach, if Bach would sit here, he was he would disagree. He would say, "Hey, I play my music every time differently." So, but it's never the same song twice. Ne never always the same notes, you know. But yeah. in, in classical music, you basically you should play. The notes that are on the paper. <laughs> Basically. We have a, uh, a little musical example I think we could probably uh, turn to at, at this point, which might be kind of fun to hear how we actually do never play the same song twice in the, just the second slide there. Um, this is actually a very, very special example, the slide number two of the, uh, the slideshow that we were on. Um, where it, dating from the very first workshop of Charlie Parker's Yardbird. And I don't know, Daniel, maybe you want to tell us how this ended up happening. Um, it was just the first half of the opera had been composed. We have a little uh, uh, example of the recording that was made. This is in Philadelphia as you're, you're, you've, you've written the first chunk. Yes. And we've got a big room full of Opera Philadelphia and Gotham Chamber Opera and probably other yeah, opera companies. Yeah, there were a lot of people there and um, Larry Brownlee couldn't make it. And then there was another um, tenor that was so, so supposed to sing it, but he, he was ill deposed, a very fine musician, but uh, he had a completely, did not an, um, you know, Afro-American background, and he had a hard time singing it. And then finally, Ron Daniels, the director, uh, called me up, um, 
like 11 o'clock at night, right the, the day before we, we had this first presentation of the opera, Daniel, you have to do something about it. That's not going to fly tomorrow. They're not going to like it. And uh, maybe the opera is going to die. You have to play the whole thing on the saxophone. And then I said, OK, wait a minute. This, I, I can't do that. I don't, I don't have to write saxophone with me. And you know, that would, would be tenor saxophone for Jolly Parker. Uh, I only have the soprano, and he said, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, you have to do it, <laughs> otherwise this thing might die tomorrow. <laughs> I said, like, okay, no, no, I don't want it to die, so I, 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 I played the Charlie Parker. <laughs> so at the first workshop, you played the role of Charlie Parker? Yes, the first half of the opera. With I some other singers it. doing the other no, roles? No, the other but... singers were singing what, what they're supposed to sing, <laughs> and I was Amazing. playing um, the, the Charlie Parker. So we have a little taste test. We'll hear this one little passage from the first aria, Birdland, and, uh, and maybe, Bridget, if you want to set up what happens in that first scene, we'll hear how it sounded played by Daniel Schneider on the sax, soprano sax, uh, and then what it sounded like with Lawrence Brownlee. I, but in, in the, in I the actually very... never heard that recording, so that's what I'm... <laughs> no, It was set up for us, if you would, just the opening, when the curtain goes up in the opera, this... So when the curtain goes up, um, we see... Charlie Parker, he has just died. Um, and he is in Birdland, the Birdland that he wished, or, you know, reimagined. Um, and so he finds himself like, oh, you know, I'm here. And that's the opening. So let's listen to this little clip with just the sack. You'll have to figure out which word goes with which note. juicy chord, those jazz chords with ninths and elevenths and thirteenths. Can we now hear that same business with instead of the piano that was at the workshop, the orchestra, and instead of you performing, we appreciate your performance, uh, Lawrence Brownlee. Great too. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, another uh, interesting thing our audience will uh, will hear is scatting in opera. That's written down, and I would love to hear how you two collaborated on these because these are words in lo in the libretto. They're, they're written down. Boop, bop, beep, bop, boop. Did you tell us about how that collaboration happened? Well, yes. I mean, one th one thing about jazz is. Um, I mean, you know that, that the articulation is completely different from classical music. You know, in classical music, you have ta 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 ta, ti 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 ti, ta 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 tin, ta 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 ta, ta. And, and the jazz guy would go bo ba do ba, be ba do ba, ba ba da do do ba do ba, do ba do ba, and and it goes on two and four. You know, all American music goes on two and four, and European music goes on one and three. That was a ta 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 ta, ta 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 tin, tan 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 tan, ta 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 ta. And the other thing is da ba do ba, ba ba do ba. Bum, 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 bum. So it's and it's a little bit more laid back. So it, it's a lot of things are, are really different when it comes to the phrasing. And what I just was doing was a little bit the scat thing. If you have, that you actually use syllables like ding ding da ba do ba do ba 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 do ba 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 ba
And the classical musician would would la 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 so this is the this is the difference, and that was also very hard um, to to actually bridge these two worlds. It's not something that has to do with the notes. What I was just singing, I was singing the same notes twice, uh, exactly. You know the same thing, but the articulation is different, and that's something you cannot write down. That's also what Charlie Parker is talking about in the beginning. How can I write down my my music because uh, you know that. The, the notation system we have from classical music is not reflecting the articulation in jazz. So that's a part of the opera's uh, topic. Mm -hmm. And Bridget, how did you work in uh, a scatting run into the conversation that these men are having? I was listening to <laughs> them do it. You know? <laughs> Just that easy. <laughs> well, it, yeah, not easy, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Not easy, you know, but that's what they actually did. I mean, uh, Charlie Parker and TZ, uh, they were always uh, singing their music like that. You know? Well, I was lucky enough to go to one of the early rehearsals, and uh, the people, the, the musicians who weren't singing were really into the beat. You could see them moving with the music as it went along. It, it was moving them, so uh, success, I think. <laughs> and Abe, you went to a rehearsal, I think, just over here with just piano. Yeah. Well, you must have, because the orchestra really doesn't start rehearsing until tomorrow is the first time we get them all together, just a week and a half with the orchestra. But it's interesting when we just heard those those two little bits. Of course, you've got the flute doing the birds when he's talking to the birds. They're, yes, they're, obviously, there they the are. flute has to do birds. Yeah, yeah. but uh, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the way you've orchestrated it, and also a point of interest for our crowd here in Seattle. We're going to hear the, the, I think, the biggest orchestration, because uh, we're in the biggest yeah. theater. That this, uh, this opera has been performed probably, uh, I mean, different productions. I think it's something up to, it's around eight 10, times, 8, 8. Not, eight. I, yeah. yeah. There's, there's I, been I a lot of, yeah. for five, an opera that's only five years old, you've had a lot of performances. This may be the biggest, but it's available, it's sort of scalable orchestration, isn't yeah. it? You can do it with... Uh, our, uh, maybe a Mozart size uh, orchestra, you can do it, you were telling me, in New Orleans in, is it March? May, or in May? May, April. Yep. In May, April, they're going to do the other orchestration? Yeah, that's a club version, you know, the Birdland version, which is just brass and one clarinet and the rhythm section. And here we're going to hear the, the, the big version with uh, additional strings. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, uh, in instrumentation is is, um, is an interesting question. Um, I was in the, in the beginning when I when we did the first part, I didn't want to use a saxophone in the instrumentation because I didn't want to, wanted to duplicate Charlie Parker, and it would be also unfair to the saxophone player that has to play, <laughs> <laughs> to play Charlie Parker. Well, so I, I I I did want to do that, and then his voice I, is the tenor, isn't it? I mean, the tenor takes over for the sound of Charlie Parker's soul. So he's the sax. Yes, exactly. So I didn't want to, to, to duplicate that in the orchestra. But then after I played the whole first part on the saxophone, Corrado, the, the music director in Philadelphia, came up to me and said, in the second half, you have to have a saxophone. We need a saxophone. It needs to be like. And then that's why the saxophone only appears in the second half of the opera. <laughs> Well, it's pretty ingenious, and I don't know how you guys came up with this. This is when we go back to Kansas City, and Addie turns on the radio, and she's listening to her son, and she's very, very proud. That's my boy, and that's, I think, the first time we actually hear the sax yes. coming out of the orchestra pit. So it's yeah. wow. sort of technology, uh, you know, across the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other um, uh, instrumentation was uh, would definitely you need um, a rhythm section to play this kind of music. So the rhythm section is um, written out in this opera. This is a, a piano part, which is very, very difficult because it, it's basically written out jazz, but not really jazz, also classical music, so it's in, in, in between. And we should point out that in the Seattle Opera Orchestra Pit, playing the uh, piano part is our fantastic uh, David McDade, who happens to be here with us this evening. Um, David McDade, who's on the music staff of Seattle Opera and uh, for, is, has, has had duties in the pit before, but uh, this is, yeah, I know you've challenged yeah. all of the musicians yeah. with this score. Yes, and then we have a brass section with um, trumpet, two trumpets, and a trombone, and the French horn. 
and that gives a little bit the kind of a big band sound when we need it. And then we have obviously the strings and, and they, you know, the Charlie Parker did an, an album, Charlie Parker with strings, and he was, um, yeah, um, at the time a lot of music critics hated it because they thought, okay, now he's, he's trying to do something commercial to make money. And um, oh, for him, it was one of the most important um, uh, recordings that, that, that he made because he always wanted to actually expand into, into orchestral music and into the, the sound of strings. So for him, it was very important. And for the time, at the, you know, at the time they thought, okay, he, you know, the purists, the jazz purists thought, okay, now he's selling out to, mm. to the audience when adding strings. Because what the strings are doing is they make the music um, rounder, nicer, più dolce. <laughs> and the brass is actually, makes the music more gritty. And then, uh, in addition to that, I, we have a, a woodwind section with a, a classical woodwind section, not with, uh, with a bassoon, uh, flute, alto, uh, flute alto, right? you know, both flutes, uh, the regular flute, and then in, in one of the solos, an alto flute, which is a special flute. It's a, you don't hear it that much in classical music. I, I mean, it's a. Yeah, Mahler uses it, and so it's, uh, it looks like a, a, a regular flute, but it's much, much bigger. And I used that because I didn't want to use uh, the saxophone, but it's, Charlie Parker played the alto saxophone, so I'm using actually the alto flute instead of the alto saxophone in, in the opera as a, as a, solo, as a yeah. solo instrument. Maybe we should, you guys could tell us a little bit about that scene, because in many ways that's the most enigmatic scene, the sort of the mm -hmm. crux of what happens in the opera. When we hear the alto flute solo, it's in this kind of, or what would you describe it as, orchestral passage, mm -hmm. um, the Camarillo uh, sequence. Yes. Uh, that the Camarillo, that's uh, actually the mental hospital in, 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 in California, in Los Angeles, and um, Charlie Parker is uh, there um, after he had a nervous uh, mental breakdown. And uh, the scene is without singing. I mean, there is a singing going on, but without lyrics. So, um, yes, uh, this is, is, is a kind of... Um, yeah, a crucial th scene because it, he's he he's in the madhouse and nobody knows whether he's gonna make it out of the madhouse. And um, then after that, he had a very a creative uh, part again in his in his life. A creative and, uh, yeah, burst. Yes, interesting. Um, Bridget, in the libretto, in the printed libretto, you have a fascinating sort of st note or, or stage direction there in the in the Camarillo sequence about this experience of sort of staring off into the distance. And when we hear the alto flute on stage, uh, what you will see is, first of all, Charlie in a straitjacket, and I think there's some other characters with straitjackets, sort of standing on a chair and looking off. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about where, where that comes from. In the Seattle production, this is also where we're very excited for the first time with Charlie Parker's Yardbird to have a, a dance element. Spectrum Dance and Donald Byrd are okay. joining us for this particular particular scene. But tell us a little bit about where this all came from in your research and how that how that make took shape. Well, this is his description of what happened to him after being arrested and then um, sent to the mental institution. Um, that he noticed that um, people would stand around for a while and then one day one would drift off into you know feet away and start looking up and thought, and they seemed at peace and he wondered, well, what's that? You know, because he wasn't at peace. Then somebody else did the same and somebody else. And over time, he finally said he walked and he saw what they saw, whatever that was. <laughs> so, yeah. And the thing is also the music, if you look at this whole passage musically, because I think you're gonna play a clip where I, I, I played on the alto flute. Um, what you're losing um, the downbeat, so the whole music is, is, is starting to lift up. You cannot predict when the, when, when the next downbeat is going to come. That's something in, usually in jazz you don't have that. Um, you can lose the beat, yes, but um, 
it's 4-4 four, four or 3-4. <laughs> and this composition is actually shifting from 7 to 6 to 5 to whatever. It's more and sort of Stravinsky approach to rhythm to time signature. Yeah, it it's, it's, just, it's just hovering over the ground. It's no more grounded. And that reflects on, on, on the mental institution. And Shall we uh, get a little musical clip in here? This is a, a video that I think is on your YouTube page um, of the, the alto flute solo. So, uh, Alex, if we talk all over, yeah, that's the one. We'll hear a, a minute or two of this uh, special, special recording of what you'll hear in, in the opera with the dance sequence. Beautiful. A, a very evocative piece, and I, how do I describe the dance, which, which has never been done before, Donald Byrd's just been here. I was actually choreographing it in this room, because this has got our sprung floor in the mirrors right here, but it's certainly not ballet that goes with this, but this much more sort of interior experience. Mm -hmm. I'm eager to ask both of you, because it's not something that we've seen often on the opera stage, how can you in opera represent the experience of addiction? and withdrawal, and these very, very intense interior experiences. Is that something that you were conscious of as you were putting the, this piece together, this journey of this particular man? Uh, you, you talk now about this passage or the whole opera? Well, I mean, yeah. there's other spots in the opera where it, yeah. it seems to me that that's kind of what's going on. Well, yes, this is this one thing, you know, in, your, in the whole opera, what you see is that there are, there are parts where you have a, a certain beat a certain uh, repetitive pattern in it, which is very common in jazz music. Uh, and then you have other parts, uh, like this part, uh, where you lose that downbeat, where, where the whole thing actually goes into a completely different direction. 
And uh, I was definitely playing with, with these two elements, which are really completely different also for a singer. One, one moment he really has to play with time, he can actually stretch it, he can go, uh, he can do a natural rondo or ritardando, and the conductor can go with him or they can actually do something with time, and other passages where they can't do something with the time, but they can do something inside the time. So maybe you're not aware with that, but if you write an opera about jazz music and um, classical music, um, Classical music is dealing with time in a completely different way than a jazz, jazz music. Jazz music at the time is going through, like usually it's, a, there are no ritardondos or accelerandos. I know uh, Charles Mingus did it and so, but usually there is not, no, not, no accelerando, which means, accelerando means getting faster, you know. But in classical music that happens a lot and also ritardando really doesn't happen. And, That's why we have conductors. You can't yeah, do it without them. So, so you have to actually, the conductor has to manage between the two worlds and see, okay, here actually I have to, I have to insist on a time, you know, that, um, bang, ding, 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 that that has to go through. And then there's another, uh, another part where, where there, there should be a lot of freedom. And um, Yes, that, that's just an aspect uh, of the opera that a lot of people are not aware of, you know, that these are the two different worlds that, that, that come together there. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the similarities uh, between jazz and opera classical is uh, uh, a real strength in using vocalists, uh, using their voices as instruments and maybe singing without mm -hmm. words. But of course, there are some wonderful words uh, in this opera. And um, Bridget, I'm not sure if you'd ever written songs before, uh, but how did you go about solving that puzzle of writing words that could be sung? Oh, uh, well, I was a poet, so, you know. It's just writing poetry, really. I remember the, the song that Chan sings, uh, that was a, a love song to him. And um, so we just, I just wrote a poem. Um, yeah. Song lyrics in that one, it's the reference to, um, uh, there's another one of those little, yeah, good, those little Easter egg uh, references to Oscar Hammerstein, isn't it? Um, uh, the, the song, All the Thing. Uh, all the Things You Are. All the Things You Are. Uh, you are you are My Angel Glow is another. Mm -hmm. um, it's a line that's in the libretto, but mm -hmm. in this case it's their favorite song or mm -hmm. their little code word. That's that their they, code word. Yeah, yeah, in the word. dark on the 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 far side of midnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay, there's also, a now's the time, now's the time, that's what, what he's saying, now's the time to actually write that composition because, uh, and um, now's the time is also very famous. Um, Charlie Parker tune. And this is actually in the opera too, if you listen to it. And around midnight, you know, there's the favorite tune of Nika, the Baroness. You can you hear it somewhere in the clarinet too. So, but we have this very very rich uh, libretto for this. I mean, the, your poetry in this opera is, is is a major part of the experience. I have a question for you. Since we are now going into a, the biggest space that Charlie Parker's Yardbird has yet played, we're going to have super titles. Don't worry, every word will be up there for you. But how do yeah? What uh, as you were putting this opera together, were there discussions of the technology of either amplification because that sometimes happens with contemporary American operas, you know, so that the singer are on mics, mm -hmm. which makes their voices louder and helps you guys get their words without supertitles, mm -hmm. or that with that process of, of doing titles, how you, how you feel about those technologies? Or how you um, the opera is written in a way that you can play it amplified, you know, even almost like, a, it's not a musical, you know, it's not, it's an opera, but still you can actually do it amplified with other operas like Italian operas or, or some German operas like Wagner, it's, it's more difficult to do that. Well, and it's not part of the tradition, I mean, I think, like, yeah. like the John Adams operas that are being done nowadays, he assumes that you're going to have mics with those, on the, all those singers, and it's become a yeah. part of a thing. The problem is when the drum set is really playing loud, um, then you know it's probably going to be difficult for the singer to, to cut through. But having a jazz opera without the drum set is also a no-go. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the um, the aspects of time throughout the uh, throughout the opera, uh, not only in the the 
construction of how we go through the show, uh, but also, as you were speaking earlier, about the time signatures and, and um, whether that's related at all to the looseness of jazz or the intoxication of drug addiction? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I'm using a lot of, of time signatures that don't exist in, 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 in jazz at the time of Jolly Parker, like 7-8, uh, 7-4, uh, seven, seven, or eight, even, you know, like this, uh, the part that we just played, uh, which has a seven four five four bars, um, that didn't exist at the time really, and um, for me that was just an addition to express uh, what Charlie Parker wanted to do. He didn't want to duplicate what he already did as a saxophone player. He had this, all these other ideas, and his big idol was uh, obviously um, Bartok and um, Stravinsky of the, of the um, composers of his time. And he memorized their music, and that music actually was, you know, Stravinsky was playing with odd meters, with, with uh, music going on seven, music going on five, or, or and the opera uses that too. That's not easy for the singers, but they do a great job. <laughs> they probably hate me for that. But <laughs> because usually opera is not using that. They have also four and then three. Um, but if okay. something goes on seven, it, you have to think twice. You know, otherwise you lose the beat. And Bridget, could you talk a little bit about how you bounced around in time throughout the opera? I mean, it, it, it begins with Charlie Parker's death, so I suppose in the afterlife, Time is a little bit fluid. He could be anywhere at any time. Yeah, for me, it wasn't so much about bouncing around. Um, I knew, uh, because Daniel said he was going to write something new, but he didn't do it. So for me, he mm -hmm. had to, this had to be his wish after he was gone, um, mm -hmm. just so it would you know, ring true in my head. So, and then he was also in the morgue for days before anybody ever identified him. So this is while he's in the morgue. So that's how it began. And then it was then trying to write, which is what he wanted um, him to do, write new music. So he, he starts with um, trying to write new music and then he gets interrupted by a lot of stuff. So <laughs> here comes Nika. And his life yeah. keeps catching up yes, with him. Yes, his life. There's a, a lot of it are sort of memories, or I mean, maybe you don't think of them as memories, as he remembers how I first met Jan, or how uh, when Dizzy comes in and they remember they have this great celebration of the spirit, the joy of bebop. Yeah, I didn't think of them as uh, memories. I thought of them as wanting to correct something that didn't really necessarily go right. So when he saw Chan, he knows of the, how they, they mm. broke up, how, you know, the, the last time they saw each other, this was an opportunity to fix that. Um, when he, um, Doris and their relationship, she always tried to help him. As she said, she was always trying to fix the things Charlie did wrong, but there he, he, she was trying to fix it again and he's struggling with trying to let her do what she always wanted to do. Yeah. And um, so it was, for me, it wasn't flashback, but it was a, a chance to redo something that you didn't necessarily do correctly. So with his mother defending him about the noise, because like, he played 15 hours a day, and the neighbors, and this. Um, uh, with Rebecca, his first wife, and leaving her, it was all about trying to reconcile. If you have that little moment while you're gone, but you're not, until for, for me, until somebody finds out that he's dead, because he's in the morgue the whole time, then what do you do if you could fix it? And that's mm. how I felt. His, so his new composition for me was to release himself from what didn't go correctly for him. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's like a purgatorio. Mm -hmm. It's in, in the middle between, uh, you know, earth and, and, and heaven. And at the end, he goes up to heaven. That's very obvious, but uh, in, uh, in order to do that, he has to go through the whole process of um, making peace with himself. At the end of the opera, we have this moment of release. We've got the, the bird has been caged since that little 
bit of the very, very first aria when we came in, and he was talking to about the, the birds at Birdland. And then at the end, the, um, well, the, it's one of those moments of a reference. It's a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar that Charlie Parker quotes in, in the last moments of the opera, Sympathy. Um, and, and how did that enter into the uh, thing, this, this quote of, I know why the caged bird sings? For, he was a caged bird, um, even as brilliant as he was, all the music he created with the music that he changed, but he was still caged, like we all are on this planet in a way, and then he was also caged by just the way the United States was at the time when he was um, living and what he couldn't do and what he wanted to do, and, um, and so he was always, he was bird, I mean, he, was, he was a caged bird himself. So I was remembering the poem, um, Sympathy, but I couldn't remember um, Lombard's name for nothing. Every time I typed in, um, I know why the caged bird sings, Maya Angelou's name for nothing. And I kept saying, no, that's not right. <laughs> But uh, I had to call a friend. I said, who wrote it? She says, Paul, you know, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So then I typed in his <laughs> name, found it, reread the whole poem, and it's really the last stanza that really fit Charlie Parker. And I said, you know. So you know how sometimes it feels like when you're writing something, it's not you, it's some voice from out there someplace. So I feel so close to Charlie because he was saying, do sympathy, <laughs> do sympathy. And uh, so I could, you know, I just couldn't remember the, uh, the title of it. But uh, so when I finally read it, especially that last stanza, I thought, yes, yeah, he knew why the cage bird sang. Um, you know, when his wing is broken and he beats the bars and, you know, he would be healed. It's not, it's, it's his own voice that gets him out. And so he, he you know, he frees himself. Uh, we were honored at uh, KNKX today to have uh, Joshua Stewart come by with David on piano to uh, sing a few songs from the opera. And uh, that'll be on the website, hopefully by the end of the week, but coming next week at the latest at knkx.org, uh, with a remarkable tag to that session as uh, Joshua uh, gave us uh, an a cappella rendition of Someone to Watch Over Me. Um, but something that he pointed out that I thought was interesting, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the death of Charlie Parker uh, was, and he said, well, I'm a pretty religious guy, and so it made me think about Christ and the resurrection and three days and, and all that. And I wonder if you could talk about how religion um, takes, uh, takes a role in this opera? Well, I don't know how, really how religious Charlie was, but his mother was very religious. So the, the whole inspiration for me about how the, you know, whose voice uh, really um, would anchor Charlie was his mother's. And so, um, and the love of God and the love of her son and the, just wanting all, you know, him to do well, and, um, and then I thought about my grandmother as well, and it just didn't happen for my uncle, and, um, and so I, I could relate to all those decades later after he passed away, it just never ended, you know. It was never, he was never put to rest. So um, I think that in doing this, and I, and I pictured my uncle, uh, my grandmother, Eddie, and Charlie together up there someplace. So, um, and they, and they re my grandmother has reconciled all that <laughs> with Charlie Parker. And so, yeah, so that's what I kept, you know, envisioning and why Lumbar's, uh, Lumbar, uh, um, Dumbar's um, song, uh, Met, I mean, poem met so much, in that, especially in that last name. I have another question about religion. This was sort of a footnotes question. Um, there's a moment in the libretto where uh, he's, uh, did he convert to Islam? Yeah. It, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how that happens? It, it kind of fleetingly goes by uh, in a, a passage with a lot of the scat, and it seems like he's just as... as yeah, that's as, um, uh, a night in Tunisia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the thing is that at the time, a lot of African Americans converted to Islam, and also um, Charlie Parker did the same thing. He changed a, even his name, because he was, um, in the opera, he was looking for a spiritual, also as, as a ghost when he comes back in the opera, it, uh, he's looking for some sort of um, guide, uh, spiritual guide. 
And he said, I tried everything, but uh, one of the very important parts of the opera is, is so why, as, 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 as a black man, why does God not love me the same way he loves uh, the, the, the you know, white composers that, that have these uh, great careers? And so is my music inferior? Is it worse than the music by the great um, uh, European uh, composers. I mean, I, I translate now what's, yeah. what's going on. And this is a very, for me, that's a kind of a high point of the opera, uh, the, the very crucial moment where, where he asks God, why are you not allowing me the same type of career? Mm-hmm. Why uh, do I have to suffer that much? Why do I have to suffer? And this is a, a question a, a kind of a Voltaire a question of um, the age of, uh, you know, of an enlightenment where, where he says, okay, why is that, why, why do I have to suffer that much and then this guy is not suffering at all and why am, am I supposed to be a, a, a more of a sinner than, than the other guy? So, so this is a very existential question and that's also addressed in the, in the middle of the, more or less in the middle of the opera uh, in a conversation with Doris that uh, I, I don't know that that well, but uh, she was a religious, right? Uh, well, or, Doris, Doris opera, was sang. really, and there's, um, she did an interview on tape, so I got a chance to really hear her own voice and her, her experience with Charlie Parker. She kept his life as best she could in order, um, even to making sure he found his heroine so he can go play on stage, she, and, and his, his life was very ordered while he was with her. And um, so for me, she was sort of that person that um, was his conscious in a way, or was his inspiration in his way, was his anchor, was his stability in, in, the way, in a way. And when they broke up, it's, that's when he, you know, um, he fell apart again. In the opera, we certainly see her with him at all those moments of his spiritual quest, this quest into those, those really, really, really tough questions. And she sings, I mean, she sings with the alto flute in that sort of transcendent moment in the scene at Camarillo. Um, we should give our people a taste of his voice, I think, and then maybe we'll, we'll grab some questions from all of, all of y'all. Um, but we have, a, what's a, kind of fun is a, a little bit of a radio interview. Abe, you want to tell us a little sure, bit? Sure, yeah, it, building off the idea of acceptance. He certainly was being accepted by some of the classical composers. Uh, he speaks about uh, Stravinsky being in the audience at some time, and uh, I believe it was Edgar uh, Varisi who, uh, who had invited him to study with him. And Edgar we have Ares, an, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have an interview with uh, Paul Desmond of uh, the Dave Brubeck Quartet talking with Charlie Parker on the radio in 1955 and Bird talks a little bit about what he was trying to do with his music and then also talks about what he wanted to do in the future. So this must be just before he died because he dies in, in March. January of, 1955. Yeah, 1955. Yeah. He played this, the old Seattle Civic Theater which is now McCall Hall in 1954. I don't know if anybody here was there but uh, he, did, <laughs> he did come. Um, Alex, can we go to slide number three and we've transcribed it. We've got some super titles for you because it is a, kind of an old recording but what Charlie Parker's own kind of gravelly bass voice. Ever since I've ever heard music, I thought it should be very clean, very precise, as clean as possible anyway, you know, and uh, more or less to the people, you know, something they could understand, something that was beautiful, you know. Mm-hmm. There's definitely there's stories and stories and stories that can be told in a musical idiom, you know. I mean, you wouldn't say idiom, it is so hard to describe music other than the basic way to describe it. Music is basically melody, harmony, and rhythm, but I mean, people can do much more with music than that. It can be very descriptive in all kinds of ways, you know, all walks of life. And don't you agree, Carl? Yeah, and you always do have a story to tell. It's the, one of the most impressive things about everything I've ever heard of yours. Well, that's more or less the object. That's what I thought it should be. Ever since I've ever heard music, I thought it should be very clean, very precise, as clean as possible anyway, you know. And uh, more or less to the people, you know, something they could understand, something that was beautiful, you know. Mm-hmm. There's definitely there are stories and stories and stories that can be told in a musical idiom, you know. I mean, you wouldn't say idiom, it is so hard to describe music other than the basic way to describe it. Music is basically melody, harmony, and rhythm. But I mean, people can do much more with music than that. It can be very descriptive in all kinds of ways, you know. All walks of life. But don't you agree, Carl? Yeah, and you always do have a story to tell. It's the, 
one of the most impressive things about everything I've ever heard of yours. Well, that's more or less the object. That's what I thought it should be. Uh -huh. I think you did more than anybody in the last ten years to leave a decisive mark in the history of jazz. Well, not yet, Paul, but I intend to. I'd like to study some more. I'm not quite through yet. I don't consider myself too old to learn. No, I, I know many people are, are watching you at the moment with the greatest of interest to see what you're going to come up with next in the next few years. Myself, among the, the front row of them. And uh, well, what have you got in mind? Well, seriously speaking, I mean, I'm going to try to go to Europe to study. I had the pleasure to meet one Edgar Varese in New York City. He's a classical composer from Europe. It's a Frenchman. Very nice fellow, and he wants to teach me. In fact, he wants to write for me. some things for me for, you know, more or less on a serious basis, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, if he takes me over, I mean, after he finishes with me, I might have a chance to go to Academy of Music Hall in Paris and study. The principal, the prime, my prime interest still is learning to play music, you know? But you want to study learn. playing or composition or everything? I would study both. I never want to lose my horn. Yeah. yeah. But you never should. Never mm -hmm. can tell. I want to do that. And wouldn't you know it, the, the worst audio came right at the part that was most of interest to us. <laughs> but thank you for that transcription. Let's uh, go ahead and grab a, a couple questions from our audience here. And I think um, Abe, maybe you take that side and I'll, I'll be over here. We'd love to get your voices on our mics if anybody here has a question for Daniel or for Bridget. Yes. Oh, with all the struggling that um, Charlie Parker did, did he also struggle economically all his life? I mean, I know musicians back in that era were not compensated very well. Yes. Um, that's a big problem, that um, African Americans were not able to collect royalties at the time. And, that's, it's, it's, and uh, the rec recording industry works that, that you actually, as an artist, you get money from, from selling records, but they were not allowed to collect that. Uh, in the 50s. So, yes, economically he was not in a very strong position, but uh, he actually made, uh, he made quite a lot of money also in Europe and um, spent it, let's say, the unwisely. Uh, that's um, the same story with Mozart too. You know, everybody was saying Mozart was a poor man. He was not a poor man, but he spent his money also unwisely. That's, uh, yeah, that's probably a part of, of being so genius that um, you're not very economical with your money. <laughs> and I think too it was really heartbreaking for those musicians at the time that like, you know, Birdland was named after Charlie, but to work at Birdland he had to, or any other place, he had to go hire somebody to, to mm -hmm. um, actually pay him to go ask the man that wanted him to work there anyway. So it was just a way of, you know, taking more money away from him when the guy would never say, can you come play here tonight? But no, he's got to go ask, you know, Bob to then go at, to ask Bob. Bob comes ask Charlie. Charlie has to pay Bob so he can go back and tell the guy that wanted him to play. Yes, you can play. So. I'm interested in how the composer and the librettist work together to come up with a story. Does the when you were composing the music, did you, were you thinking it was starting in a morgue and you were writing the music for that setting? Um, and then do you give the librettist, you know, what you want to be uh, addressed in each segment of the music? Or sometimes does the, does the librettist come up with the conversation and some direction yeah. to the story that then you have to adjust the music to emphasize, for example, uh, what the librettist is writing? No, it that doesn't work like that. Um, it, it works like that, that the librettist is actually is coming up with the libretto, and then we discuss and fight over the libretto for a long time <laughs> before, before I actually write the very first note. It's, it's, it's like a month of fighting over, over, <laughs> over each line and then and, and the scenes and where, and then I, I have my personal, you know, not personal, but the needs as a musician, I already uh, said that in the very beginning that you don't have one aria after the other, aria and one, aria two, and so, that you have duets, that you have uh, three people singing at the same time, so the text has to reflect that, obviously. And then we discuss for, for a couple of months, and then finally we come up with a libretto, and then I start composing, 
And then the fight starts again, because as soon as I start writing the music, I realize, okay, that doesn't really work that well, or this word is too long, uh, or we need to repeat that, the, uh, you know, something which is rather complex needs to be repeated in music. It's different from a play. Um, you know, in, in a play, if you say things three times or four times in a row, um, people think that you, maybe you, yeah, you're not really normal. Um, uh, but uh, in, the, in the music, in a libretto, you have to do that. Actually, you have to repeat uh, the sentences. And then what happened to Bridget in the very beginning is that she came up with uh, 80 pages of libretto. And I said, okay, I'm not Wagner, sorry, we can't do that. <laughs> uh, there's no way, because the, the format was defined. Uh, when, when, when I get the, got the commission, it was 100 minutes. They wanted to do a 100-minute uh, opera without intermission. And if I get a libretto of 80, 80 pages, you know, I end up with uh, probably four or five hours of, 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 of opera. So this is, these are the kind of things that need to be discussed before I even start writing the music. The music is always uh, the last thing. But to defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here we go. <laughs> I had to write everything I felt. And then I knew, even if, if I didn't have a collaborator at all, you have to do that. And then you just have to, you have to cut it down. You know you have to cut it down. Mm -hmm. But I felt like these were real people, and I had to be true to these real people. And so, yeah, it was long. Yeah, it was long. <laughs> <laughs> I, think well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very normal thing because uh, a theater play, um, and Bridget was also a playwright, and that was her first libretto. Uh, a theater play moves much faster than an opera. An opera moves very slowly. And uh, one has to take that into uh, consideration. And, um, Time for just maybe one or two more questions. We had one over here. Uh, Bridget, I, I wanted to ask you, as you spoke to people that had known Charlie Parker while he was alive, how, uh, how did they express any hole that he left? I just think he would have been a, an amazing person to have in your life, and when he was gone, well, what residual uh, sort of feeling or hole, what, what, as a poet, can you remember and tell us little noticings about how people adjusted to the loss of him? Most of the information that I used in this came from um, interviews that I did not give. There were just interviews from the past or this particular book that had a lot of people write down their memories of Charlie Parker a little while after he died. Um, and so he had been dead a long time before I started to um, 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 write this. So, um, and there was a, there's a book, I forget the name of it, but there's just, uh, it must be like 40, 50 interviews in it. I did read them all, but it, it was really the, the reason why the people that are in the opera, in the opera, it was his, the, the, the women that loved him most. And I could understand them more. There, you know, there was a lot of males in there, but I just, you know, they were saying, yeah, he was cool, cool dude. You know, that didn't help me much. <laughs> But you know the pain of he had been gone. Those were from those actual people's thoughts and words. And then some of them, Chan wrote a whole book. Um, it, she, then she did a tape with somebody that uh, interviewed her. 30, 40 years after Charlie Parker died, she said he was. She had been married several times. She said Charlie Parker was still the the love of my life, and she was still married to the man sitting next to some other man sitting next to him. <laughs> and uh, and so. Though hearing the people's actual voices at the time and that knew him that close was, was I felt like, okay, wow. And, and then his mother only wrote that 10 page, she has the longest pages in the whole book, but it was a rant after his death of where she was still so just de devastated as it was when she first got the news and why and who and this and the women and the this and that. She was just, and I just thought, wow. And I, I could, again, I thought about my own grandmother. It was, you know, everybody's fault, you know. So, um, so, so I could understand them. Um, and so those are the, the women that were closest to him. So that's why I, you know, I thought about them, including uh, Nika, whose apartment he dies in. 
So, um, you know, and even looking at an old tape with, um, oh goodness, what's the piano player that she was involved with then? Thelonious Monk. Thelonious Monk. Um, she was, you know, years and years and years, decades after his death, she was talking about Charlie and, you know, his death and how that just changed her whole life. It did, it just really destroyed it in a way because she had to move and then move again and then she finally found a house in New Jersey to live in. I understand she had 200 cats. And, um, but you know, it's a weight that just carries you forever because of the scandal, such a scandal it was for her. So. What's interesting, the basic ingredients of opera have been since the year 1600, love and death. Here we have an opera that's taking place in the little time space right between death and death, death, and all the people who that, that, that he loved and all the people who loved him. And we get a lot of fantastic opera out of them. And my favorite piece is probably the grief, that ensemble at the end, when you have them all, just the voices just go and all of them piling yeah, on top of each other. Yeah. Just, uh, just an experience. You'll all, you'll all get a chance to hear it. In a, just, uh, a, what is it, 12, 13 more days. We open on February 22nd and go through March 7th, eight performances of Charlie Parker's Yardbird with a radio broadcast then um, a week or so after that. Um, we're very, very excited to have Joshua Stewart here as our Charlie uh, on some of the nights and Frederick Ballantyne, fresh from Sport and Life at the Met, uh, come back to Seattle Opera. He was our Don Jose last year um, on the other nights and a terrific cast. Thank you both. Thank you for giving us this thank opera, you, and thank you for your sharing so much this evening here. Uh, we've got to uh, wrap up. Yeah, I just wanted to mention real quickly, if you're interested in the jazz aspect of this, the Royal Room will be doing a Charlie Parker uh, tribute night on uh, the 17th of February over at uh, the Royal Room in Columbia City. And also coming up, uh, KNKX is teaming up to, uh, uh, with the Seattle International Film Festival to present a screening of Clint Eastwood's movie about Charlie Parker, Bird. That'll be on the 20th uh, uh, at uh, the SIF Cinema Uptown on Queen Anne Hill. Uh, Jim Wilkie will be there before the show uh, to uh, talk with a couple of uh, local saxophonists about Charlie Parker. And I hope you'll be there for that one too. It's a Thursday night, but it's two days before we open the opera. So if you're not at the rehearsal, check out the, uh, the thing. But at this point, we do have to wrap up the official portion of this evening. Let me remind everybody as you exit, you can go out through the elevator just around the corner here, or else if you want to take the stairs, our staff will show you which staircase to take. As you go out, there may still be uh, people in, from the KCTS spillover in the lobby out there, and we'd ask you to be respectful of them. And if you want to stay and chat with us about Charlie Parker's Yardbird and about opera and jazz and the stuff, we'll be here for a while. Thanks so much for being here this evening, and thank you both for all you've given us.